It's just an eclipse, not an apocalypse. Relax. There's a lot of fear and hype and lies going on about the total solar eclipse, but I don't want you to believe none of that bullshit. I'm here to set the record straight. Let's get into it. This video is all about the total solar eclipse, learn what they are and what they aren't, my personal experiences with them, and how they can change your life. So let's start off with what it is, and that is in its simplest terms when the moon passes between the earth and the sun. The path of totality itself, as it traces the earth, the shadow, is only 100 miles long at its widest, but usually about 50 to 40 miles wide to really be inside the path of totality where it's 100% total. And depending on where you are in the path of totality, the phase only lasts between one to four minutes. And totality itself is where the sky darkens and the corona becomes visible. At this point, you might be wondering, what is the corona? So I'm just going to break down the most common terms of the eclipse for you and define what they are. The corona is the sun's faint outer atmosphere. It looks like a glowing ring or crown surrounding the dark circle covering the sun. The dark circle covering the sun is the moon's shadow on the earth, and that's called the umbra. It's this umbra shadow that causes the total eclipse. Right before and after totality, you might see a beautiful diamond ring effect. This happens when just a tiny bit of the bright sun peeks out from behind the moon, making it look like a diamond ring. Bailey's beads are little bright beads of sunlight shining around the edge of the moon during the diamond ring. These are caused by sunlight peeking through valleys on the moon. Prominences are those reddish clouds or loops extending from the sun's corona. These are clouds of hot plasma being expelled from the sun. So now I want to talk about some of the misconceptions surrounding eclipses because there's a lot of fear, ignorance, propaganda, lies, and just misinformation that is inappropriate at best to be spreading. And I just want to set the record straight on some of the top ones. The first one is that a uh, total eclipse is not safe to look at. There, you know, it's funny driving around because I see a lot of people just afraid because they've never seen a total eclipse. Like we're in Texas right now traveling around and it's funny, like just a lot of the older people, they don't know what's going on. It's like this big festivals happening, this big deal of the eclipse. And a lot of them are actually, you know, Christian churchgoers. And so there's a bit of a faith bias going on. They might think it's like end times. And I've heard some religious hype about eclipses, but that's all it is, is just hype and ignorance, which is fine, naivete perhaps, um, but it is safe to look at an eclipse. And a lot of that's just stemming from ancient superstition and just word of mouth stuff that people are just spreading. So it is 100% safe to look at a total solar eclipse. You just have to wear glasses during a partial. That seems like common sense to me, but I just want to be clear about that. You can't look at the sun because the partial is still very bright. The, that sunlight is intense. But when it clock when it locks into 100, that's when you take the glasses off. Day turns to night. Here in Texas, this eclipse is going to be four minutes long, four and a half minutes uh, where we're at. And for four and a half minutes, you can look right at it. And I highly recommend that you do because it's one of the most beautiful sights. I wouldn't want anybody to be robbed of that amazing, breathtaking, jaw-dropping sight. The second misconception is that 99% uh, uh, of totality is as good as 100%. Over the last two eclipses, some friends and peers and associates that I've talked to, I'm like, come on into the path of totality, which again is only 100 miles wide at most, sometimes as thin as 40 miles. Come on into the path, you know, the one in 2017 in Portland, Oregon, where I'm from, I told some of my friends, come on, you know, they were just like a short drive away and they wouldn't even make a short drive into it. They just were busy, not interested, whatever. That's their choice. <laughs> but uh, they were like, you know, it's like 99% here. I'm good. I'll just put on some glasses and kind of check it out. Oh, it's kind of eerie. The shadows change, you know, they get sharper, but it's nothing like 100%. So... 99% is far from the experience of 100%. The third misconception out of many that I'm not even going to get into, just the third one, there's some people think it's unsafe for pregnant women to see a total solar eclipse. 
Um, that's actually just laughable to me, but um, some people believe that, so I just got to share it and get the record straight. You know, there's a lot of misinformation that pregnant women shouldn't eat raspberries or whatever it is. That might be true for some people at some times, but not for the general population. It is absolutely safe for pregnant women and everyone to see a total solar eclipse when it's 100% in, in the path of totality. So those are just three of the top misconceptions that I've come across. Want to set, set the record straight for you. Now I'm just going to share a little bit of my backstory with you about total solar eclipses. I first heard about them back in about 2004 in Portland, Oregon. I was at a coffee shop reading a book because I used to read books from the library all the time. I'd bike to the library and go to a coffee shop and read them. And one of them was a book by Andrew Weil called Marriage of the Sun and the Moon. And that was a book about alternative and holistic methods for healing the body and the mind and bringing more positivity and energy into our lives because you know that's what i'm all about learning over time and that book was fascinating because each chapter kind of goes over a different subject he and in this book andrew wilde documented his travels around the world experimenting with different cultures methods of altering the state of consciousness so the first chapter for example opens up with throwing up in mexico because throwing up if you think about it, it's actually a mind-altering experience. It changes the state that you're in from a normal waking state like this to one where you're kind of high and in a different mood and everything. So if you can remember when you're throwing up, you're not thinking about anything else. You're just totally in the present doing that thing. And so it's fascinating to think about how throwing up, some cultures, that's what they do. Another example in the book is, you know, in some cultures, eating cacao is very ceremonial and can alter your state, re release serotonin and bliss chemicals. Um, another example over in India is eating mangoes. You might take it for granted here in the United States or, you know, you just go to a grocery store, pick up some mangoes that are not very ripe and you just eat them in a hurry. But in India, you know, it might be a ceremony, a ritual where you get mangoes off of the tree sit there in the shade of a mango tree eating it and as the juices get on your skin maybe the temperature outside is just perfect and you and what they do is they get blissed out they alter their state of consciousness through eating mangoes so that was a fascinating chapter drinking coffee is another one chewing coca leaf you know in colombia and south america that's very ritualistic and healthy actually Cocaine is the extract from coca leaf, just in case you didn't know. Ingesting psilocybin mushrooms in some cultures is one that might be obvious to you to alter the state. Eating chilies, spicy food in a lot of cultures, um, that's a personal favorite of mine to alter the state. You eat some really spicy food, you're not thinking about much else besides what's going on with your body and mind in the present moment. And the final chapter in his book is about total solar eclipses. So that's, I read that book and all those chapters and I was especially fascinated by the total solar eclipse. He was saying how it alters your state of mind, your consciousness for spiritual awakening, healing, and just an all around good time. I was pretty fascinated and so I started researching like when they were and stuff and I read that they were years out into the future. Another one was going to be happening in the United States in 2017. I was like, wow, wouldn't that be cool to see that? And fast forward to 2017, sure enough, I traveled, I road tripped with my wife Tracy up to Oregon, saw that one, jaw dropped, felt like I could cry. It was a transcendental experience, changed the state for sure. And it magnetized me, it called me to be an eclipse chaser or an umbra file. You know, umbra is the shadow, if you remember and a file is lover, so it's a shadow lover, the shadow of the eclipse, lover, so you chase it around the world because it's an experience like no other. And so not everybody gets charmed by a total solar eclipse, but some people do. I'm one of them and Tracy's one of them. So then we traveled down in to South America in 2019 to see the total solar eclipse in Chile and that was amazing. Um, link in description if you want to see the vlog on my channel. I shot a three-part series of our trip down there showing the eclipse. You should check that out. And then uh, the last two eclipses, 
um, we weren't able to see because they were in Antarctica. It's crazy just to get down there. And then traveling during COVID was a nightmare, if you remember. So we weren't about to mess with all that bullshit. And so here we are in 2024. Uh, total solar eclipse here, April 8th, going from Texas up to Maine. And so we're in Texas. Hopefully the weather's going to be good. We're going to see this one. And uh, I've actually got a map with all the pins on them for where total solar eclipses are for the rest of our lives. You know, if we're going to live to like 90 or whatever, you know, we're, we've, we're planning them out. And so this is one thing that you can do if you're excited about eclipses is plan your future travels. It's like your own travel agent has your itinerary already figured out. You don't have to think about where do I want to go for a family vacation or whatever in the future. It's all taken care of. All you got to do is travel the world every two years to see a total solar eclipse because how often do they happen? They happen anywhere around the world about once every 18 months or about a year and a half to two years somewhere around the world okay and you can hit me up in the comments to ask me where and i'll i'll help you out I'll point you to the website links and everything uh, people think they're a once in a lifetime opportunity but that's because if you don't travel in one place you know like the next total eclipse to happen in the united states is 20 years from now in 2044 it's going to be crossing the central part you know colorado and all that so if you want to wait another 20 years, you know, it'll come to America then. But the next one is happening in 2026, crossing like Greenland and Iceland. And then the one after that in 2028 is going uh, over Egypt and the whole Middle East over there. That's going to be pretty epic. And then the one after that is going crossing like New Zealand, Australia, and then on and on about every two years. Additionally, humans crave connection. We need it for our survival, and it's a very nice thing to have when we can get it. A total solar eclipse is actually one of the greatest feelings for me of connection. Dur when it locks in a place and during that two to four minutes, it's mesmerizing the sense of connection. There's like a silver thread being connected to, it's like eye gazing into the most mysterious divine eye looking back at you that's just pulsating and glowing you know the beads and the ring effect and all that it, it, and if you're the type of person to cry you'll just cry some people cry out with joy they scream it, it emotions come to the surface and you feel so connected to the universe the mystery of everything birth death and and joy and and sorrow and everything in between all of that is in the total solar eclipse it's ultimate connection so the feeling is difficult to describe and i just tried right there it helps if i write it out and i did that in my newsletter which you can find through the link in the description the whipple effect newsletter i'm covering the total solar eclipse as a topic over three parts to go in depth um, but let me give it a try now it helps to give a broader perspective on life it encourages you to overcome obstacles. It makes you want to live more authentically. And it gives a renewed sense of purpose and a zest for life. It's a reminder of nature's immense yet fleeting forces. It promotes a deeper appreciation of the present moment and instills a sense of awe, humility, and interconnectedness. So I hope that clears things up for you about the total solar eclipse. Um, stay tuned for my next YouTube video because I'm going to be showing highlights from that 2019 eclipse and talking just a little bit more about my experiences with them. Hopefully it's inspiration to you to see them. And then in part three, which is coming up in a couple more weeks here, I'm going to show you uh, footage from this eclipse here in Texas, April 8th, 2024. So you can see it for yourself if you're not going to be in the path of totality. If you want to read some of my thoughts and experiences about the total solar eclipse and so much more about a holistic lifestyle for greater health of the mind and the body and productivity with work and play and families and all that, check out my newsletter, The Whipple Effect. The link is in the description. Other than that, I hope you're having a great day. Thanks so much for your time and attention to watch this video. Bye for now. Peace.